Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Anne Keala Kelly. She's an award-winning Native, Amer- Native Hawaiian filmmaker and journalist whose work works focus primarily on the early 21st century Hawaiian sovereignty movement. Her feature-length documentary, Noho Heva, has been screened and broadcast internationally and is widely taught in university courses that focus on indigenous peoples, the Pacific, and colonization. So first, thank you so much for being on the program. Hey, aloha, Derek, and mahalo nui for having me on your show. It's, it's an honor. Um, so let's, let's jump right in and um, tell me about Hawaii and tell me about the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. I the first thing I think I should do is start off with uh, who I am, and and I say that because that's any conversation from a Hawaiian person usually starts with uh, saying who we are as a people um, because we're a genealogical people. So I just want to explain to your audience that I'm Native Hawaiian, and the Hawaiian way of saying that is I'm Kanaka Oivi, and that's my genealogy is through my mother's side. Of my family, my father was Irish, and so I have a genealogy that connects me to that country as well. Um, so, and the reason that I say that is because one of the things that people usually don't understand about Hawaiians and about indigenous peoples throughout the Pacific is that our identity, who we are, is genealogical. It's not um, based on blood quantum or any other. Uh, American or European impositions of uh, identifying characteristics, like phenotypical ter- characteristics are not, that's not our tradition, or race is not our tradition. So part of also saying that is to help people understand just geographically, I'm talking about Hawaii, I'm talking about being native Hawaiian, and I'm in Polynesia, I'm not on the continent. And out here in the Pacific Ocean, uh, or what we call Oceania, or the Pacific region, again, back to genealogy, it connects us to the places that are that we are um, indigenous to through our ancestry. So I know that we can talk about Hawaiian sovereignty. We can talk about any aspect of what's been happening here, especially for the past 120 years. But for Hawaiians, we always start with our genealogy. And what 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 exactly what exactly does genealogy mean in this case? It means who's my mom. Uh, speaking about being Hawaiian, it means who's my mom? Who are her parents? Who are their parents? And we trace. You see, we have our own cosmology. We have our own way of looking at the world and understanding our place in the universe. And that for us comes through. Our genealogy, uh, our creation stories, the most famous one would be the Kumulipo, would be the Hawaiian creation story. And that connects us to all living things. So for me, I'm standing here in, you know, July 2014, right? And I'm in Honolulu, but I am who my ancestors were. I'm not just me. I'm who they were. And so if I speak to Hawaiian issues, I stand in my genealogy when I do it, which is also a spiritual thing. It's not just a cultural, political thing. So when I say that, what I'm trying to convey to anybody listening is that's my lineage and it takes me all the way back to creation. So, for instance, when I say speak to the Kumulipo, which I'm I'm not an expert on, but I know what it is in that creation story of us in our narrative or what we call our mo'olelo, humans don't even show up until a thousand generations into that story. Right. So. It's a very complex society that Hawaiian identity is uh, connected to or is from. And so once we hear a little bit about who you are, how how can can you start moving that into what? Um, if you want, either what happened prior to 120 years ago or then what happened 120 years ago. Right. Well, and, and again, I'm not trying to say, oh, let's talk about me and my family and only my family. The, the, there are some cultural issues that are connected to me even being able to speak to these things or to be a journalist or to make films about what has been going on here. Um, and, and so there's a philosophical reality to that that connects me to this place. So I guess I'm trying to – I want people to understand – culturally 
when Hawaiians speak about, for instance, the occupation of Hawaii, the illegal occupation of this country by the United States. We're coming from a very specific place. We call this place Aina. In fact, talking about environmental environmental issues is actually a, a good place to start too, because I think in most of the world, we'll, uh, people refer to the environment or to environmentalism. And in Hawaii, we call it Aloha Aina, to love the land. So there are all these lines that cross, right? There's the cultural, there's the political. And I, so it can fit into the subject of environmentalism, but it's also coming from a very specific genealogical, cultural, spiritual, political place. So I don't mean to confuse you or your audience by beginning that way. It just is the right way in. No, I think it's, I think it's really important. I think it's, it's very important. And, and so to get to the issue of the Hawaiian, the, the occupation of Hawaii, you know, there are many places in history we can start, right? Captain Cook, most people think our history begins with when Captain Cook showed up here. Or for Americans, uh, their understanding of Hawaii begins with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. We have this long history that happened way before Captain Cook. And we have this whole other history before and after Pearl Harbor that has almost, that has nothing to do with us as a people so much as it has to do with the American occupation. So I refer to the U.S. occupation of Hawaii, which began in 1898. I think that's a really good place to help people understand what's happening here with regard to the environment or the culture or the politics of the place. Um, because it's like, it's like a wheel. And, and in the middle of that is this thing called the illegal overthrow of uh, that took place in 1893 it was U.S. military-backed overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani's government of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And then in 1898, the U.S. began an occupation that goes on to this day. So everything that's detrimental to the survival of people and to the survival of this place is connected to those events. And they're just kind of like spokes on the wheel, right? So Hawaiians are always contending with that part of our history, whereas most Americans, and I would say most people in the world have never even heard of it, they probably don't even know there was such a thing or is such a thing as the Hawaiian kingdom. So it's a complex narrative, right? And here I am, I'm trying to come, you know, I'm jumping in genealogically and culturally, but there's this huge history here just in the past 120 years of struggle to survive. So this this may be completely off topic, and it... it if anything, reveals my complete ignorance and makes the point about what you're saying about most people don't know this, but where I live here, there, there, there's Talawa land and then there's Yurok land, which is only 20 miles away. There were a lot of different peoples here. And I'm sorry, once again, if this is an incredibly ignorant question, but was, was, was there one Hawaiian people or were there multiple nations? Yeah, that's a good question. We're one people. Um, we're because we're an island people, so it's an archipelago. Um, again, let me just jump over to the geographical thing. Like the Hawaiian archipelago is huge. It's not just the main islands that most people see on a map. It stretches many thousands of miles out to what is referred to as the as the northwestern Western Hawaiian Islands. It stretches out to the Johnston Atoll. So it's a huge piece of this earth, of this planet, is the Hawaiian archipelago. Um, so but on the main islands, um, before King Kamehameha the first, quote unquote, conquered the islands and unified it and brought it all under one, basically, let's say one flag, um, each island had its own rulers. But ge genealogically, we're all related and connected. So we're all one people. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, the way Hawaiian language was spoken on Kauai was different than the way it was spoken on Hawaii Island. And even on Hawaii Island, it would be different on the Hilo side than on the Kona side, right? So each area had control of its own day-to-day -day culture, right? So, but we're just one people. We're not like, when I say the peoples in the Pacific, like if you look at Micronesia, right? We can say, oh, the Micronesians. There's a lot of different countries out there and all of them are very different and they all have different languages and different histories, right? So it's really complex out in the Pacific. For better or for worse, Hawaiians, or what I say, or we call Kanaka Oivi, or Maoli, were a people. Okay. Um, so, so 
if you don't mind, can you move us through the conquest? The conquest. Hey, that's great that you use that word. We're not a conquered people. <laughs> so uh, that's, let me just move into that part of the narrative. Um, we're not a conquered people. In fact, we're people who are fully aware and becoming more aware every day of our rights, not just our human rights, but our, our legal rights under international law. But yes, there was an event called the illegal, referred to as the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. And that was perpetrated by uh, descendants of missionaries who would come here. And they were all plantation owners. They were haole, which means white people, um, most of them. And they uh, wanted more control than they had. And uh, the short version of that is that in 1893, the U.S. Marines were landed, uh, I think it was January 17th, 1893, and surrounded the palace and uh, became known as the illegal overthrow. These, um, the perpetrators of that, Sanford B. Dole and others, established what they referred to as a provisional government. And then for the next, let's say, five years, there was a fight to reinstate Queen Lili Okolani's government. The United States was a big part of that. Not only did they um, aid in the overthrow of her government, but eventually it led to them occupying the Hawaiian kingdom. I, I need to say this. Uh, Queen Lili Okolani was the first woman of color to be the head of a nation state. That's not something most people are aware of because when they think of Hawaii, they think of it as the 50th state of the United States. They don't know this other history. So in 1842, Hawaii, the Hawaiian kingdom, was internationally recognized as a country, just like France or Germany or America. The treaties that the Hawaiian kingdom had with these countries, it wasn't like, you know, in, on the continental U.S., and uh, Native Americans refer to the treaties, right? Because they had treaties with the United States. Those are, that's a different use of the word. We had international treaties about trade. We had embassies in like 90 different countries. This was a whole different world out here. It was an international country. I mean, there was an international uh, community here. There were many languages spoken on the street right up until, the ni until 1900. Hawaiian language was the main language, but there were many other languages spoken here, Japanese, Chinese, French, Italian, Spanish. There are a lot of people who came here, but it was Hawaiian. This was a Hawaiian world. So when we talk about the illegal overthrow, when we talk about the occupation, we're not talking about an occupation as in uh, like what was happening with Palestine, which is now a, country, a place that's going to be recognized as a country, right? That's a different kind of occupation. We're talking about the occupation of an actual internationally recognized country. And I think people, and I don't, you can't blame them. People are confused because they don't know that history of Hawaii. They just see us as another native or indigenous people who have been colonized and overwhelmed by the United States. And our history is slightly different than the natives who have had to bear uh, the brunt of American genocide and uh, colonization. So, I think you're making – those are all really important points, and, and I want to focus on one word you said there for a second, and mm -hmm. that's – you said the word dole, and that's a little bit familiar. Um, <laughs> our, dole our, pineapples, right? Yeah. So yeah. are you suggesting that the United States would actually overthrow a sovereign state to um, support um, – economic and agricultural interests? Yeah, sugar and pineapple and all that. Yeah, I am suggesting that. I mean, they've done it with other places that didn't have like an actual nation state in place, right? But yeah, that's that's the US history, right? Um, yeah, and, and so it was it was actually it's actually dole. I mean it's actually the dole we all know about. Yes, yes, that yeah. would be dole. Yeah, the Dole Pineapple Company. Yeah. It's uh, Alexander and Baldwin. There are many uh uh the mission we, we call them the missionary uh, companies or uh, the big five and you know it's a whole history of the descendants of the missionaries who came here to save us with Jesus and then uh, set about to uh, steal everything they could get their hands on and then you know bring us right through the 19th century there's a few other things about the 19th century and, and again these are not unique to Hawaii especially if we're talking about us as a native people the diseases that were brought here intentionally knowingly 
unleashed on the native population. Within, you know, six decades, 90 percent of our people were killed off. At the same time, our kupuna, when we say kupuna, that means our elders, those kupuna and the ali'i, meaning the leaders, they also understood something else was happening to their people. So they secured a Western style of a constitutional monarchy to create a future for the Hawaiian people because they could see what was happening throughout the Pacific. No other Pacific Islanders have that part in their history. Um, they were overtaken and dominated by France and Germany and you know other uh, uh, Spain. Um, even today, Tahiti is still trying to get out from under France um, and gain its independence. What's happening in a place like today, I don't know if you're familiar with West Papua and their struggle for independence right now to free themselves from Indonesia, right? So our struggle throughout the Pacific has been an ongoing thing for 200, over 200 years. So, so after, after the overthrow, um, what, what, what happened then? What happened is that the Hawaiian people, um, you know, having dealt with the British trying to do a similar thing, uh, a couple decades earlier, the Hawaiian people went about using diplomatic channels to get the United States to, I guess, reinstate would be the right way to say it. Because President Cleveland acknowledged at the time that it had been an act of war perpetrated by the United States against a, a peaceful nation that they had a treaty with, right? Have a contract with, right? So over the next five years, this Sanford B. Dole gang tried twice to annex Hawaii to the United States. And the way that's done is like if Canada wanted to become a part of the United States, they would take what's called a treaty of annexation and they would go to the U S Congress and they'd say, please make us a part of your country. Here's our treaty. We cede our land to you. We cede our sovereignty to you. So twice this provisional government tried to do that and twice the U S Congress wouldn't even vote on it. And one of the reasons is because in 1897, the Hawaiian people, and at that time there were only about maybe 40,000 of us, um, they signed what's known as the Ku'e petitions. Almost every single living Hawaiian person signed that petition, and it's almost like a declaration of independence, but it's actually just a petition saying, we don't want to be part of the United States. Just very clear. We don't want to be a part of your country. And... So that kept the treaty, the second treaty, from being voted on. So there was never a treaty of annexation. What happened was in 1898, the United States Congress sat down and created what's called a um, congressional resolution to annex Hawaii. So they created an internal document, a domestic document, and they used it to exercise a foreign kind of power, a power over a foreign nation. So it has no legal standing under international law or even American law. But they did use that as a way to cover up what became what was the beginning of the military occupation of Hawaii in 1898. Now, that occupation and I don't like to make America's argument for America when I speak about this. The excuse of taking over and occupying Hawaii is that the United States is trying to at that time. It's an empire, right? They're empire building. And they're reaching across the Pacific and they're trying to do whatever it is they're about to do with Asia. And they're also trying to, quote unquote, protect their West Coast. So from the beginning, it was always about sacrificing Hawaii to an American ideal of itself. And it's, it's not comfortable to say that because most Americans think they're entitled to other countries being sacrificed for their supposed protection. But in 1898, the United States began... Uh, went into what's referred to what's called the Spanish American war. Right? right. And that was over who's going to get to control the Philippines. So they used Hawaii as a military outpost from the beginning. I live in Honolulu. I live just, you know, a five, 10 minute walk from Kapi'olani park, which is in Waikiki. And that was like a camp, an army camp in 1898 where these U S soldiers fresh off of the Indian wars a lot of them on their way to the Philippines to murder Filipinos. And that whole history there is a blood 
bloody history because eventually after they so quote unquote won the Spanish American war, uh, a genocide of at least a million or more Filipinos uh, took place, and that was Americans committing that genocide, American soldiers. So Hawaii has been this uh, contested and complex place ever since those events, and the cover-up of our actual history has been going on for over a century, despite Hawaiians actually speaking out. So now we find ourselves, if you jump forward to the 21st century, after 120 years of that, we are home to the largest military command on Earth. And then there's all the other things that come with that. If you think about what the military did on the continental U.S., the military goes in, clears out the Indians, makes the land free for settlers to come in, right? And that becomes their society, not the native society. So we have just a different version of that. The military comes in, occupies starts to take places and doesn't ever stop and pushes the native out, pushes the native out, forces the native out. And then we have this enormous population of Americans that just come in and take over everything. So it's, that's, that's our history kind of in a nutshell with regard to the U.S. occupation and our reality today, we have a population of about, I think it's 1.2 or 1.3 million. Most of that, most of those people are on Oahu. Hawaiians are a minority in that population. I'm, I'm, I'm once again stuck on something you said a minute ago. And, and once again, everything, I'm, I'm so grateful that you're saying all this. And, you know, I, I feel like I know a lot of history of U.S. imperial and, and, and current reality of U.S. imperialism. And there's still stuff I'm uh, connections I'm making I haven't before, and one of them is that I, I completely understand the role of. There was someone in your film said that um, Pearl Harbor was bombed because of the U.S. military. Now they weren't bombing Hawaiians on purpose; they were bombing the U.S. military, which means that they're attacking Hawaii, and um, we all know why. Hawaii was important in World War II, but honestly, I never really thought of it. And I, I've read a lot about the so-called Spanish-American War and about the genocide against the, the, the Filipinos, um, which was so horrible that even Congress held um, held uh, hearings on how bad the torture was of the Filipinos, which is which is something when it's so overt that even Congress acknowledges that they're torturing. Um, but anyway, the point is that I'm not sure, and you're going to go, duh, but I'm not sure the Spanish-American War, so-called, would have been possible without the the prior annexation of, of Hawaii, would it? Uh, well, first of all, I want to say it wasn't an annexation. Sorry. I, no, uh, no I, I think it's important to say that because – and the reason I say that is because in our narrative, and it's very hard. I, I'm going to talk about representation in a second. But it's we call it the illegal annexation or the so-called annexation because right. there was no treaty of annexation. It's like a ghost, right? Oh, there goes a ghost. It's called annexation. But without the occupation of Hawaii and the takeover of Hawaii, no way could they have done that to the Philippines, much less bully Japan into World War II. And that is really what happened there. You had two empires, right? Japanese Empire and American Empire. And they were fighting already over who's going to control huge parts of the ocean, of the Pacific. So without being present in Hawaii, the United States couldn't have done what they did in the Philippines and everywhere else in the Pacific. And by the way, they're still doing it. They couldn't have done what they did in Vietnam. Right. You know, every war since the Spanish-American War has been launched out of Hawaii. And, and that's something, again... People, I hope they can understand that when I say that. Like if you take a map, right, you take a globe or just lay out a map of the earth. And if you just kind of situate it in a different way where you put Hawaii in the middle because it's in the middle of the largest ocean on the earth and it's the most isolated archipelago that is peopled, right? And if you look at it, you can see how huge the area is, the region is, that the United States is still uh, – taking more control of right now as we speak with the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the quote-unquote Pacific Pivot. These are uh, these soft terms that show up in corporate media that completely whitewashes or rather bleaches the Hawaiian narrative into just not even existing and says things like 
well, we're going to do this specific pivot, and isn't that so great? But if you really look at what's underneath that thin layer of the, these terms that they use, it's, it's about controlling, further controlling, and furthering the empire building that started in 1898. Without Hawaii, without the occupation of Hawaii, that whole project ends. If the occupation ended tomorrow, that whole project has to end. The U.S. empire starts to lose its oxygen. It loses a limb. And, and that's one of the reasons that I made the film, and that's one of the reasons that I've done uh, the journalism I've done the past 14, 15 years, or even being on a show like this or speaking out about the occupation of Hawaii, is because I want, I hope that, and a lot of us, it's not just me, I'm representing p other people when I speak this way, but I'm not a member of a group other than the Hawaiian people. Uh, um, but the hope is that people throughout the world will start to understand, you know, if you have an issue about saving the planet, intervening on environmental destruction or climate change or empire or colonization or any number of things, please look at Hawaii. Because the most powerful empire in the history of humanity is the United States. And it is almost single-handedly, except with partnerships, destroying the planet through multiple corporations, uh, multiple corporate interests. The military industrial complex is massive. The genetically modified organism industry is massive. These are just two things that are heavily controlling Hawaii and life in Hawaii as we, as we know it now. People have no idea what's really taking place out here. And it is, it is a catastrophe. Truly, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's such a, it's a heartbreak. You know, when I was thinking about, yesterday I was thinking about, uh, I should get ready for this interview that I'm gonna do with you today. And then I realized, God, no wonder I'm so pissed off. Because as I just start to make a short list of things that I need to mention, I just, it, it's impossible not to be angry about what's taking place here and the ignorance around it. You know, the willful ignorance of people not to question or really try to understand what the U.S. is actually doing out here in the Pacific. Um. Yeah, I I completely agree. And um, can you talk about some numbers for a second on um, what percent of uh, Hawaii is um, is uh, is is actual military bases? Sure. Um, and a lot of this information is available online. And, and that's one of the things that at the end of my film, when I the, the titles run a list and you can see dozens and dozens and dozens of names of military installations. There are main military bases. That's mostly what people will see online is here's like 20 different bases that the U.S. has in Hawaii. What people don't see is the other hundred things attached to those bases that the military controls. So. I think it's better to sort of understand you've got the island of Oahu, which is about 640 square miles. That's not too big. And um, at least 25% of this island is, is controlled by the U.S. military, directly occupied and used by the U.S. military. And that's not counting the water, and that's not counting what happens in the air. And then you, um, I would link to that also what's taking place on Haleakala, which is the U.S. Air Force. And that's the mountain on Maui. Uh, everybody likes to go up to Haleakala and take a picture of the sunrise. If they would just turn around and look at the other thing taking place up there as they're having their nice vacation, right? They would see that it's being controlled by the U.S. military. If you look at the uh, top of Mauna Kea, which is a, our most sacred, one of our, it's probably one of the most sacred mountains in Polynesia, actually. I think it's the highest, the tallest mountain in Polynesia. All the telescopes up there, all the federal and military uh, control of Hawaii is beyond something like just referring to something as just the military bases. The military would like us to just think, oh, well, they just have this valley or that valley. It's far, far more insidious than that. So it isn't just about training to murder people. Like uh, in the beginning of the film, you see Makua Valley and it's so beautiful and it's so devastated. And uh, the military goes in there, the army goes into that valley and they train, they train how to shoot people and kill them. And then they get on a plane and they go somewhere and do that. Right. Um, so it's, I would want people to understand that it isn't just, I mean, it's a lot to say, wow, 25% of Oahu is controlled by the military. That's an outrage. 
Makua Valley has more than 40 endangered species in it, and they're playing war games in there? That's, that's ecocide, pure and simple. Uh, Pohaku Loa, which is on Hawaii Island, which is at the base of Mauna Kea, where all those telescopes are, that's the largest live fire training area outside of the continental U.S. It's massive. It's bigger than the island of Kaho Olave, which was bombed to death by the United States and 50 years of trashing that island, using it as a bombing target. And that's no isolated island. That's just off the coast of Molokai and, and Maui. It's right between them and Lanai. And, and this month right now is a thing called RIMPAC. And every two years, the United States invites like 22 other countries to come to our waters and, and practice murder and you, bombing targets and everything. They're all over here right now, literally. Who knows how many innocent dolphins and whales are being killed right now from their sonar rubbish and their missile firing. These are, these are the things taking place here, and the rest of the world just is oblivious to it. I wish people would pay attention to it in a different way. I mean, I understand your question, like, let's talk about numbers, but it's almost hard for me. I can't really calculate, you know, where they really are because they're in so many places that don't show up on the Wikipedia thing or, or that, the, that the military won't even give you that information, you know, the specifics of it. It's so far-reaching uh, that it's, it's almost impossible to quantify it. And then here we are, a native people struggling to survive in a place where, you know, it's so expensive to live here because of what they've done to the economy of the place. And by the way, the U.S. military has had a, played a huge role in that. And, and we're trying to survive. And at the same time, we have to deal with RIMPAC. We have to deal with uh, the past two weeks of the Department of Interior sent here by President Barack Obama to try to uh, cajole us into becoming a native tribe and becoming federally recognized. And why don't we just give up our, our rights to independence here, sign here. We're dealing with all of these different things. And at the same time to circle back to just our genealogical spiritual reality, our connection to this place, we're the ones that are going to be, we're the ones that are damaged by the environmental destruction. We're the ones that are displaced by what's done here economically or militarily. Thousands of Hawaiians are homeless every day. That's our everyday reality. Thousands of my own people. Literally, I can drive an hour away from here and I will see what looks like refugee camps. And they're almost all Native Hawaiians. Um, so I, I, I know you asked me one question about let's talk numbers about how many military bases, um, but it's so far reaching that it's just beyond the, those 20 bases that they'll admit to. I'm thinking a couple things. One of them is you were talking about people um, not paying attention. And I, I think about this a lot that where I live, maybe six or seven years ago, it used to be that the frogs were so loud at night that you couldn't have a human conversation outside. And the frogs are, <laughs> which, is, which is great. And the, the frogs are, the frogs are disappearing here. Like they're disappearing everywhere. And so many, um, I was asking one of the neighbors, have you noticed the frogs disappearing? And he said, no, my gosh, I, I hadn't heard. And the only way you could not know that is if you never, ever went outside at night. And the point is, I guarantee that if the San Francisco 49ers disappeared, this guy would know tomorrow. <laughs> and it just it breaks my heart that what is I mean, it's just it's, it's just there. You know, what is important to this culture is what is important to this culture. And what is not important is what is not important. Um, but having said that, so I just wanted to say that. And then I want to go, go to my to my next question, which is, um, and this I sent you an email. You know, my mom was asking this after I watched the film with my mom. And one of the things she asked is, is so, you know, with Monsanto or tourism or the um, the destruction of 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 the whole water water ecology of Hawaii or the military I mean, what 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 is what is what is the most depressing or what is the hardest for you yeah I thought about that because 
it's a it's almost a trick question, but I understand it. I don't I'm not saying your mom's trying to trick me, um, but it's a really tough. It kind of speaks to I'm going to go back to that idea of like it's a wheel. Right. And in the middle of that wheel are certain historical events that took place. And then everything else is a spoke off of that wheel. So the genetically modified organism industry, which is taking over huge parts of Hawaii as we speak, um, and it's just already enormous. Um, that's part of that. It's a, it's a spoke on that wheel. Um, the taking of the water to create uh, golf courses and resorts and condo complexes and also to uh, farm GMO thing, you know, GMO, uh, quote unquote, food, but we can't eat that food. That's a, that's part of the same thing. And if we look at that issue of GMOs, it it's not even a, a, a one degree of separation from militarism because Monsanto also created Agent Orange and, you know, chemical warfare on Hawaii has been going on for a long time. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, as the Hawaiian person I am, I have to hold it together and I have to say, well, you know, it, we have this issue of um, militarism and we have this issue of what's being done to the land and the water. But these things are not disconnected in the film. Actually, I would say in the film, the most important issue in the film is the subject of desecration and how that's used to completely undermine Hawaiians and dispossess us and just really devastate us culturally and spiritually. Um, so again, that's all connected to these events that created a military occupation that allowed for a million other people to be here who, you know, they've made Maui look like Orange County. Um, it's, it's not any one thing. Uh, it's all connected, taking the water for certain things that's connected to the occupation and settlers being able to come in through that occupation. For me personally, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, I really thought about, cause I could feel what she was getting at with her question. And for me personally, I always come back to the spiritual because that's what I came into this life with. And that's what I will leave it when I leave this life. That's probably the only thing that'll leave this life. And and so I always am looking at what's happening in our environment, what's happening to our land, what's happening to our water. And I, I understand that in a more of a spiritual way. You know, the word heva, it means wrong. But to say something is heva isn't just to say, oh, that's wrong. Like, oh, you made a mistake. It's like a pretty serious use of that of Hawaiian language. Um, and it is so heva, all these different ways into dispossessing and pushing Hawaiians out that I can't lose the line on uh, how connected they are. And it's precisely because of that spiritual genealogical connection here. So I can almost stand in any place in Hawaii and say, okay, here's what this industry is doing, or here's what that industry is doing. And these industries will seem unrelated. Like nobody's going to make a connection between Walmart. I mean, typically people wouldn't typically connect Walmart to Monsanto, but it's very, it's totally connected. And the connecting point is the Hawaiians, the Hawaiians as a people, um, the Hawaiians spiritually and culturally and politically and historically. We're the connecting point for everything that's heva here. It can't be here unless it's damaging us. White supremacy or colonization, these have to have a target to actually express themselves. You know, these are systems, right? I look at it systematically and the institutions that come up around these systems. We're the target here. So it isn't any one misuse of the resources. It isn't any one bad thing done to the Aina. It's all of it. And it's all part of a history of intentionally undermining and dispossessing and pushing out Hawaiians and forcing us to assimilate. And assimilation, and I didn't make this quote up. I mean, this is scholars talk about it this way, but it's, Assimilation and genocide are two sides of the same coin. Yep. I think his name is Patrick Wolf. He's a scholar in Australia. And so when people look at Hawaii, they don't see genocide. They see what's wrong with those Hawaiians. Why aren't they happy to be American? They should, they're so lucky. <laughs> and, and they don't see actually what's in motion here, what the process is. And I remember some years ago, a crew from Al Jazeera came and they made this really nice piece called the other Hawaii. And so I co-produced that with them. And I took them out to Hawaii night. That was the first place I took them because I wanted them to see, for me, the most vulnerable people are, are 
are are people who are houseless or homeless and impoverished. So I wanted them to see that first. At the same time that they're seeing that, I'm we're in Waianae, and that's like not famous for like, hey, let's go to Waianae because it's so beautiful, right? Most people want to stay in the Waikiki area because they don't want to be out there where all the impoverished Hawaiians are, right? I take this crew, and they're pretty Akamai. They're smart people. And even they were just sort of overwhelmed by the beauty of the place. It took them some time to really understand homeless Hawaiians in such a beautiful place. So we're constantly having to contend with being in a place that is so, even though it's being raped to death, right in front of our eyes, it's still so beautiful and and so um, spiritually alive. And I think most Americans, they get confused. They don't understand when they feel some kind of good thing, like, oh, they call it the Aloha spirit. Mm, That's the way they talk about it. It's as if Hawaiians don't exist. They're talking about some dead thing. You know, Aloha is a philosophy. That's the concept that has been dumbed down by the tourism industry, but it's a philosophy. And it's inherently political and cultural in that. It's not just some kind of simple word that we throw out to people. It's, it says much more than what it's saying. So you asked me one small question, bra, and I gave you this big, long answer, but um, it's, it's all connected. And I have a very, very, it's very hard for me to just pull one thing out and, you know, observe it. Well, I mean, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's, it's the whole culture. It's, it's, um, top to bottom. It's like Vine Deloria said that if, um, if we're to survive that, um, all of Christianity has to go and most of science, and I would actually say all of science, but leave that aside. You know, it's, uh-huh. it's, so we basically have three or four minutes left and there's two questions I would like to ask. And I'm sorry to cram these questions in, but, but maybe we can do another interview where we, we just focus on these. So the two questions are, can you tell me once again, sorry, we have three minutes, but can you tell me about resistance to this? Once again, I'm sorry to do you know, two or three minutes. And then second, what do you want people who hear this interview to actually do? Oh, um, yeah. Right. So, so can you, once again, I'm sorry, we have, we have at most four or five minutes. So you can go up to like four or five minutes. Can, <laughs> can you give me the, 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 the A, the entire history of resistance? <laughs> and, um, and also, of course, what's happening now and then what people can do. Right. Yeah, resistance is just, its like I said, it's been ongoing since the uh, illegal overthrow in 1893 and, and since the U.S. takeover. Our resistance in the past 30 years has been more known to people. Some people have heard of the Hawaiian sovereignty movement, um, and that changed from being a model that was based kind of on a nation within a nation, Native American model back in the 80s. Hawaiians became more educated about our actual rights as an occupied nation. Um, and it became about independence. Now, some independence people will say, oh, it's not an independence movement. They'll correct me. They'll say, Keala, it's not an independence movement. We already have our independence. We're occupied. And, and under international law, that's absolutely true. And even under US law. Um, I'm more inclined to want to get people moving and work in a kind of agitate, get them to, you know, get them agitated so that they start to pressure um, the U.S. and other countries to pay attention to the Hawaiian call for in- reinstatement of our independence. Um, so resistance takes on many, many forms here. So p- some people do go into just the environmental issues. Some people do go into just the cultural survival issues. I mean, our language was almost completely, uh, it was almost eradicated, you know, because in the beginning of the 20th century, they took it out of all the schools and all the institutions. So there's been a, the past 30 years has been a, a lot of resistance to, to many terrible things that took place the 75 years before that. Um, so today, what we see now is, especially with this past few weeks with the uh, Department of Interior showing up and calling Hawaiians to speak to the issue of federal recognition, what we see is a lot of Hawaiians speaking out and knowing and speaking about international law and knowing that the United States has no jurisdiction here and saying to the Department of Interior, why are you even here? You don't belong here. If you want to talk to us, you should send John Kerry because he's the State Department person that we should be talking to, not the Secretary of the Interior. So our resistance in, at the moment right now is taking on a, a even even a newer kind of uh, power 
and energy. And um, so things have been really exciting the past few weeks to see so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Hawaiians. I'm talking hundreds of Hawaiians at each hearing coming out and saying to the Department of Interior, we don't want you here and you need to tell your president that it's time to deoccupy. So that's something I would like your audience to know about because I know it probably sounds, it sounds foreign to them, but it's true. We have this option as a native people in our country to call for the deoccupation of our country. I would hope that people around the world would see that as uh, something to support, to support Hawaiian calls for deoccupation and any forms of resistance that might happen to get out in the mass media. Because it's not easy to get these stories out. It's really difficult, but oh, to have it come out and actually be represented properly. We didn't actually end up talking about the subject of representation. I just want to say on that note, it's, it's almost impossible for Hawaiians, for us to represent ourselves in mass media. Noho Heva is a film that I wish people would see because it has many of these issues in it, but also because I'm a Hawaiian person and I made it. And in the 21st century thus far, and we're in 2014, it's the only Hawaiian-made feature-length film about Hawaiian resistance to the U.S. occupation of their country. So that it's kind of a unique film in that sense. But it's us representing ourselves. And it's really important that we, that we try to at least communicate to people who we are from being who we are. So... I th uh oh, you asked me a second question and I missed it. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, um, actually, I have another question too. And once again, I'm sorry for the ignorance, but so is there is there the equivalent of like the free French government or free Polish government in World War II? Is there is there a free Hawaiian government that is that is extant? Uh, you mean you mean in Hawaii or is I'm not e sure I understand. Either way, question. either way, is there is what? What, what does it look like? Yeah, what does it look like? <laughs> yeah, well, it's looked like for the past 10 or 15 years, it's looked like multiple groups saying, I'm the leader, I'm the leader, I'm the king, I'm the kingdom, right? So that gets used against us a lot. But the fact is, there's actually a whole history of international law that people are beginning to invoke right now on the international level. Hawaiians have been to The Hague. They've been to the ICJ, they go to Geneva, and it's not just about the indigenous peoples, the permanent forum on indigenous peoples issues. I'm talking about independent Hawaiians. So I, I'm, I can't say exactly what it will look like, but I think by the end of this year, a lot more people will hopefully know about this because we're having to fight against the federal government trying to federalize us to cover up the crime of the occupation. So we have I can tell people where they can get some information. And, and one of the people who's done a lot of the research and who is a leader in this uh, arena and this part of our history and where we're at is um, a man named Keanu Sai, uh, Dr. Keanu Sai. And his um, website is Hawaiian Kingdom. I think it's HawaiianKingdom.org. And there's another one that's HawaiianKingdom.info and there's more information there. And you'll see in, in some of that information online that there are multiple groups, kind of competing groups, but not competing in the way where we're not after deoccupation. So our first step at this point is to move people's consciousness in this other direction so that they stop looking at us as the 50th state and understand that we're moving, we are moving to reinstate our country or the independence of our country. That's a huge thing to say, by the way, Derek. I don't, <laughs> just saying those words makes me feel uncomfortable. It's a huge thing to say we are confronting the United States of America and telling it that it has to leave. That's a, that's an enormous kind of narrative to try to bring to people when we're such a small group, but it is, it's the right thing to do. If people care about the planet, if they care about the environment, if they care about climate change, I would hope that they would look at what Hawaiians are doing in our calls for deoccupation, because I don't know that there is another way to save this place from what's being done to it. I don't know that there is some other door to walk through to stop the devastation of this whole part of the planet. I think that's the fastest and probably best way to go is to move through that door. And I don't even, by the way, I'm, I'm going to end this kind of on a negative note, but I don't even like the nation state structure. I don't even really like it. I think it's been devastating to the planet, this form of uh, governance. 
but we have this option and, and, and we're trying, we're, we're moving to exercise it. And that's as a Hawaiian person, I think that's one way It's probably the strongest way to save my own people, help save my people from what's being done to them from our erasure, from our removal. Well, I loved that you had the, that the person, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but I love that the person in your film said exactly what you just said too, about how, yeah, nation states, we have a critique of that. Um, but that doesn't alter the fact that we have these tools right now that we need to use. Um, anyway, we are out of time, and thank you so much for, for your work, and thank you for being on the program, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Ann Keala Kelly. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. Thank you so much.